feel I've been sitting down in this space. Wonderful to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Langston Hughes wrote, I am so tired of waiting, aren't you? For the world to become good and beautiful and kind. Let us take a knife and cut the world in two and see what worms are eating at the right. A few weeks ago, I heard a news report that gave me pause. It concerned the annual assembly of both the Southern Baptist Church and the Unitarian Universalists. It appeared that the Baptists were having great difficulty with the idea of accounting for the issue of racism and white supremacy as a fault line in their organization. The Unitarians, on the other hand, who had taken a stand on the racism issue in the 60s, also found themselves mired in the topic of race when they took a long, hard look at their organization, office holders, and discovered to their chagrin that whiteness was still the ace in being hired for more important leadership positions. Congregationalists, according to the reports I have read, have also been struggling, as have the Catholics, who have had to face the shame of Georgetown University having been slave traders, even as they had been so proud of having a black president in their early years. But as my daughter, a Georgetown graduate, reminded me, Mom, remember that race and slavery are at the bottom of all these issues. You told me that. <clears throat> it is really irrelevant in what denomination one sits. Sooner or later, the issue of race will arise, and sooner or later, it will have to be seriously examined. As James Baldwin reminded us, only what is faced can be changed. And I need to say that again, because we keep fumbling around in the same pit all the time. Only what is faced can be changed. Sooner or later, our pretense must end. The first verse of our scripture reading today tells us to maintain justice and do what is right. What a colossal challenge this has turned out to be for us as a nation. Some have called racism America's original sin, and it has certainly been a stubborn and painful thorn in our political and social life. It has powerfully thwarted all our efforts to achieve justice and liberty for all. It has destroyed the ground under our feet as to make integration nearly impossible. Some of us are daily intimidated by fear for our lives and the lives of our children. Too many of us despair at ever having the experience that so many celebrate. That is, knowing that we are safe in this land of the free and the home of the brave. Too many of us have lost faith in that promise, especially when our lives are pockmarked with the many microaggressions we struggle to endure. 
Our patience grows thinner by the day as we struggle to have our voices of despair heard. Justice served in dull-sized saucers will not eliminate the fury, will not satisfy the yearnings for equality. So today, I cordially invite you to hear some, just some of my experiences in this so-called post-racial society. It is my hope that hearing these stories, my personal tale of lament, will give you some additional fodder to keep on with the struggle for an improved environment of peace and understanding between us. Maya Angelou said, when we know better, we do better. These are not stories easily or readily shared, but I offer them in good faith that they will provide deeper insight into the why of our separateness. So come for a walk with me. I have something to tell you about my experiences right here on Cape Cod in our racially improved America. Let me begin by introducing you to my mama, Mrs. Lola Scott. Having accompanied my mother to shop downtown Boston, it was time for a little refreshment, so we stopped at a coffee shop. We waited for a long time while others came, were served, and left. Mama grew weary of this, and standing at her full height, about 5'3", she loudly declared, do you know who I am? I am Mrs. Lester Scott, and I am still waiting to be served. The server hardly glanced at my mother having noticed her earlier, only so he could then ignore her. We were never served. But I left having learned a few lessons for my life. A few months later, I wrote my first anti-racism argument for a speech class in college, and no one asked a question or expressed an emotion except the professor. I was learning to break the silence around this issue as the only black student in the class. The privilege of growing up with Chinese, East Indians, Portuguese, Jews, Syrians, Latinos, English, Scots, made for a very different family involvement and interaction in Jamaica, where I was born and raised. Perhaps that is why I was so ill-prepared for this experience many years later. Right here on the Cape, remember, I'm not leaving the Cape. I'm telling my stories right here on the Cape. I was participating in a class dedicated to learning how to listen. After one of the exercises, we were told to hold hands in a circle. One of the participants, the one next to me, hesitated and then said, I have never touched your species before. I have never touched your species before. I am not certain I have ever recovered from that response. The only sound in the room is what you just did, a sustained gasp. No one 
said a word, at least not until the next meeting. Surprised? Well, let me tell you of another incident. My husband and I were at a dinner party where we knew a few of the couples among the many. Just before being seated, one of the women near me, whom I had never met, looked at me and in the most earnest tone of voice said, you look just like my dog except that she has a little white under her chin. I was in polite company. I was brought up very well. I am not the swearing type. And I was furious for all those reasons. <laughs> the more I thought about it, the angrier I became. And the more my anger turned toward my husband, who I was certain must have heard this woman's insult for me. Later on our way home, my husband asked why I had been so quiet all evening. Of course, I answered nothing <laughs> before I told of the insult. I felt so alone and targeted as the only black woman in that room. And by the way, that is often my situation. I did declare to my husband that I'd never go out with him again without a guarantee of safety. To be in a situation as the only a kind of standout, show and tell, offers no escape from scrutiny and cruelty and rudeness. Which reminds me of another episode. I had to sift through them, you know. There are so many. This time we were at a wedding, a highfalutin affair. <laughs> I sat at the table waiting for my husband who had gone off to speak to the father of the bride, his friend of long standing. I assumed as pleasant a visage as I could. Oh, I was looking good, I knew it, and I was feeling good. <laughs> I could mix with these people. I knew I could not be so serious as to be described as that angry black woman the commonly used epithet for black women. So I was, oh, I'm telling you. I wanted them to just ask me how important I was. Instead, another guest about four or five persons from me at the end of the table could obviously stand it no longer. Stretching herself on the table in my direction, she said, how did you get invited here? with emphasis on the you. Looking at her for a long moment, I curled my thumb toward my husband and said as calmly as I could in reply, I came with him. I am still learning how to be cool with rude behavior. As friendly a person as I am, the kind of person best described as having the ability to talk to a pole if it sways in the wind. I am able and willing to reach out to strangers. I do all the time, or I wouldn't have anybody to talk to. Sometimes it is so wonderful to feel as if a friendship one has been nurturing has been taking root. You must have had that experience of building a relationship, a friendship with somebody. It takes time. I had invested in this particular friendship in myriad ways. Hers was a rough marriage, and I had practiced my listening skills. 
I had been helpful in as many ways as possible, as many of the demands that a friendship expects. This friendship had possibilities. I knew it. That is what I thought until the day we were talking about some racial issue in the news. And she said in the most venomous tone she had ever used in my presence, my people were not lazy. They were not afraid of hard work. They came to America and just rolled up their sleeves, and that is why they have been so successful. I was literally pushed back on my heels. I got it. And even today, I wonder why I didn't say these things I, would, I began to think. What I did hear actually was the friendship cracking. In my mind flashed many of my best responses, such as, my people who built this country for no pay, my people who still have the most difficult time finding work, my people who have suffered at the hands of federal, state, and city governments by being shut out of opportunities, are unfairly classified as lazy across the board, no matter how many jobs they hold to survive. Outwardly, I began to mourn the death of something that could have been. We, you and I, are separated siblings now let me say that again. You and I are separated siblings. We speak a different language, but we have developed strategies to deal with our differing realities. Some of us have learned to laugh at the incongruences we deal with in our lives. Some of us have taken to our beds because of the difficulties we will not face. But here is the rub. We are family. I want to say that again. We are family. And for this country to be successful, in the attainment of its vision, you and I, all of us have work to do. What impacts you has an effect on me. If I am treated with disdain and sometimes pure hatred, you will feel that boomerang effect. The question for which I seek an answer is simply this. What did black people do to be so despised and hated? I'm going to ask it again, because I mull on this all the time. What did we do as black people to be so despised and hated for so long? Are we living out a kind of Cain and Abel story, maybe? What part of this mo morality play is missing? Sufficiently so that even our churches are unable to find the answer to this question or even adequately provide some of the rigorous conversation we so desperately need. W.E.B. Du Bois told us that the issue would be the color line. But we now know that the color line comes from a natural gradient of melanin. No matter how white you are, you have some of it, of course. Even that word race is unreal 
a lie, contrived, unless you mean the human race. I had just given a talk in a church and found myself downstairs looking at the walls in the children's artwork. A church member approached me and with a look of wonderment and seeming concern said to me, I can still see her holding her necklace. She's looking at me. She came up to me and she said, I never know what to say to you people. was a simple one. <laughs> I have heard that a simple hello usually works. <laughs> she was so serious. <laughs> yes, just a simple hello. <laughs> a smile of welcome the touch of a hand, an acknowledgement of my presence works wonders. I am not an alien creature. <laughs> I don't know why I have to say that. <laughs> you have to laugh at some of these things, they're so ridiculous. <laughs> I am not an alien creature. A specimen <laughs> or a species. I am not. <laughs> At least I don't think so. <laughs> I am as human as you are. I just wear a brighter wrapping. <laughs> and I do not need to lay in the sun to keep it bright. <laughs> And it is time, really, that the color of our wrapping have no bearing on our worth or value to society. Yes. It's high time. Through the years, I have chosen to speak out rather than seethe in rage. I have made every effort to be available for dialogue, to be open to questions some have dared not ask anyone else. One of the keys to the change for which I hunger is the ability to see the humanity in each of us. A human being is what we are with feelings, hopes, dreams, not something worthless of no consequence or value. Loving God and trying to be kind and thoughtful and forgiving across the lines of difference, I know it's no guarantee of reciprocity. I've learned that. My ethnicity has been burdened with every negative quality imaginable. And it has been so long in place that even our language could not be spoken without it. Notice that there's a difference between a black lie and a white lie. Just one example. There's a difference, white crime, white color. Isn't it time we ended this divide? Yes. Yes. Federal, state, and local laws have played major roles in destroying the possibility of living our lives in freedom together. Yes. Are you aware of that? 
have a book for you then. Richard Rothstein has just written The Color of Law. You need to read it. I hardly wanted to give it back to the library. I was so involved with what it told me. Richard Rothstein, or Rothstein, The Color of Law. Turning this monstrous way of living, turning this monstrous way of living around demands a sense of urgency. Only God knows what will bring us to our senses. What does it really mean to be patriotic, for instance? What do we owe each other? especially those of us who claim to be followers of Jesus. We're not leading the way, I'm telling you. We cannot really believe that racially charged teaching of the curse of Ham, to be hewers, that some of us have been ordained to be hewers of wood and carriers of water. I hope that's not lingering, but in fact, the habits are lingering. We cannot really believe that the darker one is, the less intelligent and capable and worthy of opportunities in leadership. Please tell me that's not true. My people have been silent in face of the treatment received. We have shouted. We have sat in and we have stood up. We have ignored our treatment and we have broadcast it. We have been burned alive. We have been beheaded. We have been chased from our homes at gunpoint. We have been drowned and shot. The air we breathe and the water we drink have been poisoned. Every step we have taken that promised freedom and justice has been bitterly and cruelly opposed. Learning to read was a crime. Marrying was a crime. Breathing was a crime. And living has been a crime. <laughs> she was. We begged to fight for this country and were given shoes to clean and pots to wash. We begged. Of course, being paid for our work was out of the question. But we endured, recognizing that freedom often comes at a cost. And so, and that we owed it to ourselves and those who would come after to keep on keeping on. We can't quit. We're going to be fighting down past the line. We hesitate to tell our children the whole truth, lest their rage grow beyond their control and, dis and disorient them completely. I have risked telling you these stories because you need to know why anger so often flares in our interaction with each other. If you know better, you do better. We, can, we have to stop pretending we don't know why they're so mad. No matter what position we hold, no matter how relatively successful we have been, we, people of color, often feel unsafe. A common response to all these insulting interactions is, I just don't let it bother me. And if you believe that, you'll believe anything. It does. It warps. It undermines. It distresses. And it causes sickness. I am tired of having to explain to the grandchildren why they must absorb the pain. <laughs> why they must see that incident as not being worth the bother.
I'm just about done. But let me tell you this final story. A few weeks ago, one of my sons called to tell me of an incident my grandson experienced. A woman told him, my handsome and talented grandson, that he looked like a dog. I was confident that I had already paid those dues. I was furious. I couldn't believe it. I was so wrong. It's still out there being offered gratis to children like mine. This work, this difficult and seemingly impossible work will take all the commitment and perseverance we can muster. And we will need to encourage each other in the task as we dig our way out of this situation this destructive dilemma. Justice and equality for all has too long been a dream. One student, I was teaching a class, and one student told me in middle, grade, middle school, he said, Mrs. Peterson, you have to be patient. They learn early. And I said, what do you mean patient? He said, oh, yes, Mrs. Peterson, you have to be patient. I don't know how long that's supposed to be. Rudeness and intimidation, brutality and segregation must be opposed with all our might. And when we move and go to other places, we should check out who lives there and not feel so confident we all look alike. Come on, it's time to end that. Isn't it time to end this nightmare? Yes. yes. Time. I want you to turn to somebody you might not know before I finish up and tell them what one thing I said today you found distressing, surprising, unbelievable, outrageous, or worth a long, what one thing is worth a long, engaging dialogue to bring deeper understanding and change. Turn to somebody. One thing. <laughs> Let me end with this. Let me end with this. Langston Hughes again. I dream a world. I dream a world where man, no other man will scorn. Where love will bless the earth and peace its paths adorn. I dream a world where all will know sweet freedom's way where greed no longer saps the soul, nor avarice blights our day. A world I dream where black or white, whatever race you be, will share the bounties of the earth and every person, he has man, every person is free. Where wretchedness will hang its head and joy, like a pearl, attends the needs of all mankind. For such I dream, my world.